Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have you uh, both live on Facebook and, and then through our Zoom community. And as you're all aware, there's been more regulations that have been opening up for gathering and stuff like that. And so just to kind of give you an update, we've uh, talked as a board and, and deacons and and we're going to be uh, looking at moving forward and having our first uh, meeting service. It, again, still only allows for 50 people and you need to have masks uh, for June 27th. And we're gonna be moving into the Landmark Theater, which will be uh, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And of course that will, uh, we need to, we'll have, there's lots of logistics that we're working out there, uh, but uh, it means that we will have the service time up until 11.45 and then we have to vacate unless you wanna go see a movie or have more popcorn. But uh, at the end of the day, that's uh, our direction we're going. It's a little bit of a different timing. Normally, as we talked, we'd like to move into these kind of new thoughts in the, in the fall. But uh, I felt just with the whole uh, shutdown and everything going on, that it, it'd be better to uh, at least give it a shot. So if you're wanting to gather, that's going to be on June 27th at Landmark Theater in Penticton. And uh, if you're interested in just given some input to us, send the email to vcop.ca in regards to the Zoom, as well as Facebook Live, because Facebook Live presents some issues with uh, music and uh, licensing. And so we're not able to broadcast certain things because of the licensing aspect with Facebook Live. And so we want to follow those regulations. But uh, I'm more interested is if you're interested in having the Zoom still continue on for those that are in Calgary or Calgary, but those are outside of Penticton. So send an email to our, uh, our website at vcop.ca and do that sooner than later, just to give us some input, input on that. And uh, thank you again. And so this morning, we're going to uh, move forward with our, uh, my message. Again, I just want to take a moment to, uh, say thanks to Pastor Andy and Pastor Blake, who gave phenomenal uh, messages, uh, which I listened to on while I was away. And again, in the thought exchange, we began to discuss some things. We, you know, Pastor Andy had a, uh, his different, uh, not different, but it was a really good message. And then we took kind of a 180 degree turn in our thought exchange, and we talked about the area of giving. And so, this morning, I'm going to probably prickle a few people with my message. Uh, my goal is not to get you all fired up and, and stamp your feet, but actually it's to cause you to go to Scripture, and it's to cause you to seek God in the area of giving. But it's more importantly causing you to go and seek God in every area of your life and to look at what you're doing and how you live out your faith is it a promotion of unity or is it a promotion of division? And so that's kind of where this message is. And I thought it was a good fitting uh, aspect last week with our thought exchange because it's really an uh, area that we're looking at in the Church of Corinth, who was full of different things like this. And so uh, the heart of unity really isn't a matter of getting our own way. It's actually about seeking God and helping to help other people. Uh, find God and to establish their relationship with Jesus Christ uh, that is vibrant and active and personal. And so uh, that's just where we're going today. And uh, again, I want to just say thanks to Pastor Andy and Pastor Blake for the awesome messages they both given and for everybody that's been participating in the Zoom community. You know, a few weeks ago, as I mentioned, I began to reflect on a letter written by Paul to the Corinthian church, and I'm going to just continue there and dissect this letter uh, and how we can apply this letter in our life by looking at what Paul was dealing with back in his day. And of course, the text I'll be doing uh, this week will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 uh, to 15. And if you've got your scriptures, open them up. You know, a lot of times we lose the scriptures or your cell phone or whatever device you have to read the scripture. But we'll read that a little bit later. Uh, but let's take a few minutes and just to review, review the letter's theme and background. 
Now, the Corinthian church was in a prosperous port city. It was a, a church that was full of lots of different idolatries. It had lots of money. It had lots of prosperity. It was an important city in the Roman Empire. And of course, when the church was established, uh, again, uh, like all groups of people that gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, we all have different thoughts and different uh, backgrounds and different things towards and opinions. And of course, the Corinth church was no different. It was full of controversy, divisions, spiritual uh, lawsuits, competition, and immor immorality. And despite all the problems, I find this amazing that Paul still continues to address them as the church. You know, we had a thought last week, and I'll probably use it as an illustration for next week's on building. And I think a Western problem is we think the church is a building we gather in, and there could be nothing further from the truth. In fact, when Rick Warren started uh, Saddleback Church in Orange County in, the County in the 1980s, he wanted to show people that he could start a church and grow a church without having a building. And he did. They moved 75 times, and now they're one of the largest churches in that area and prospering and very effective in their community. It's the Church of Corinth, though, is a great reminder to all of us when we so quickly judge and dismiss denominations and leaders and people in their failures and their fights, as well as that look different. See, God is not looking for us to be a people of perfection, but we're to be a people of transformation. This does not excuse improper actions or attitudes in our life, but it reminds us that Christ came for this purpose, and he came to restore us even in our failures and to show our need for God's redemption, his forgiveness, and his power to live out the life that he's called us on purpose. Paul's first chapter highlights the need in the verses for Jesus and for the Father and for the Holy Spirit. In verse 30 to 31 in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, it shows that God has given us everything. It says, God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him, who's him? Jesus, to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. It's through him we're right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us of sin. So when we use the excuse, uh, I can't help myself, if you're in relationship with Jesus, the scripture actually speaks against that. It says, yes, you have authority. You have power through Christ to overcome any addiction and any sin. Uh, and whatever that addiction or that sin is, it has, you have authority through Jesus to set you free. And then, of course, he follows it up so that we don't get all smart, smug in our own uh, freedom. He says, therefore, as the scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. See, without God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, there is no church, and there is no transformation. Also, for us calling ourselves the church, all our division and competition and judgment of others exists because we lose sight of our purpose and our need for Christ's lordship. To illustrate, I, as I mentioned earlier, I want to use the topic in our thought exchange from last week, which was a 180 degree turn from the superb message of Pastor Andy. If you haven't listened to it, go on our website and listen to that message. It was an amazing message. The topic, though, on the thought exchange was tithing and giving. Reflecting on the thoughts and data and discussion, it was not hard to see, and it is not hard to see, the various opinions and views people have on this highly debated part of church gatherings. And it's not only our church that has these discussions, it's every church. It's, and a lot of times the world looks at us simply because of how we reflect this in the world, in our attitudes and our words. So tying it into a subject matter and reflection from Pastor Andy's sermons, our perspectives and reactions always emerge from the four quadrant diagram that Pastor Andy used, thinking, action, feelings, and believing. These four parts should be utilized in every area of our life, both spiritually and naturally, in asking questions uh, in our faith, especially, and life journey. 
what influences my emotional response negatively or positively to any given situation? Why do I get so fired up? Why do I get angry? Why do I believe? Why am I at peace? What drives my attitude, my purpose, and my life? Those four questions that Pastor Andy used are questions of a life. They're questions of faith, and they're questions of how we live out our life in this world that's broken. And without reflection and dialogue in these areas, there is no growth, no transformation, no peace, only robotic, <clears throat> robotic responses with no understanding. And normally, our robotic responses will lead us in division, self-driven agendas, and cl clicks, which when varying views are presented that differ from ours, hence tithing or giving. So let's use this illustration <clears throat> on divisiveness and disagreement in the area of giving, and then look at Paul's address in these issues in the Corinthian church, not only in those areas, but in every area of our walk, and how we can apply our differences in preserving the heart of unity in the body of Christ. We're going to actually step right back to the beginning of time, in Gen uh, of, in, recorded in Genesis. Genesis 4 says this, now Adam had sexual relations with his wife. For those that are King James, he knew his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. Now, don't get caught up. You can, I can use this as an illustration, but don't get caught up in the shepherd and the ground. They were just different measures and different purposes in their life. <clears throat> Verse 3, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented, look at the word, some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs or the first fruits, depending on your translation, from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. You know, sin did not take long to bring destruction and decay into human relationship and human attitude after Adam and Eve were expelled from God's presence in Eden. Eden. And we see the effects of it in our lives personally and in the world around us. I really, I re, it really shows up in the life of Cain and Abel as our text review, reveal, reveals. And ironically, it centers around the area of what? Giving. Obviously, the principle of giving existed right from the beginning of human existence. Though no elaboration is given on both the sacrificial aspect of it and the giving aspect of it. Um, in our text. But along with the principle, so came the controversy and, and division. Satan is not a dumb being. He's very wise and has been deceiving and causing destruction uh, throughout humanity since the world began. His whole game plan is to kill, steal, and destroy you and the unity and God's creation. The text gives the key to the principle of giving, giving, and the result if we get off focus. In verse four, it says, or verse three, it says, when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord, where Abel brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs of his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. Wow, this made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. The key to giving is seen in the two words in the text, some and first fruits, or firstborn, or best. Tithing or giving uh, is not about the gift or the amount, but it's actually about the attitude. Now, that's going to step on the 10 percenters, and it's going to step on those that don't give God a 10 percent, toes. Because regardless of where you stand, we always get caught up on the amounts and the attitude. 
But really what the giving is about is our heart of giving. See, Cain gave some of the fruits. He gave God a little bit or some that he had, whereas Abel gave the first fruits. He gave the beginning of his production and his best. See, Cain offered God a tip, the leftovers, and the attitude of his giving was mostly like Paul would say, grudgingly and stingy out of duty. While Abel, on the other hand, offered his best with a heart of thanksgiving for God's provision. The result is God rejected Cain's gift it's similar to what Jesus tells the Pharisees in the Gospels of Matthew and, verse, and chapter 23, where he says, you give out of all your plenty, your 10%, but you don't follow the weightier things, which is mercy and justice to those that are, need help. They gave to follow the letter of the law. They did not give out of thankfulness to God. And so just like Cain, Cain's gift was rejected and Abel's was accepted because God gave or Abel gave out of his thankful heart. God does not need your money. He created the universe. What does he need your resources for? What, he, what can he possibly or what can we possibly give him materially or in any other area of our lives that he does not already have or could create? But what he doesn't have, and he chooses not to be a dictator in it, is your heart. And that's the point of the giving, is is it your heart engaged in honoring God with attitude and willingness out of love, not duty? See, the consequence of Cain's attitude, even being warned by God, was envy and jealousy. And of course, it led to the murder of his brother. Is this not what we do when God's people fight over peripheral doctrines, words, and methodologies such as giving, trying to get people to believe like me? What is the driving force? What quadrant are you operating in negatively or positively? And why you're trying to get people to believe in your method or way? What causes your decision making or your reaction to someone with a different opinion, whether it's in giving or every, any other area of life? See, Cain and Abel both gave. One gave with a thankful attitude, Abel. The other gave some and gave out a selfish desire and duty. The same root problem is seen in the Corinthian church in many other aspects of their worship of God. And in God's people, it's seen today in all our divisiveness that takes place over peripheral doctrines. Now, doctrines are important. You must know what you believe, but they must line up with Scripture. And at the end of the day, the whole point is to lead people to search out Christ and to know him better, not to get them to believe like me. God simply says in Proverbs 3, in the area of giving, verse 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best parts of everything you produce. That's called the first fruits. Then we, he will fill your barns with grain and vats overflow with good wine. Now there's the controversy. God said he would bless what you give, but we can turn that around and we can use it as a selfish desire. Like when we look at the promises of Abraham, it says that we've received those through Christ, according to Galatians chapter 3. And the promise of Abraham uh, in Genesis 12 by God was, I will bless you to be what? A blessing. So the giving of every area of our life is given so that we can bless others. And of course, the first place of blessing has to be a spiritual blessing of the gospel. And of course, we'll talk about that in a second. And of course, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Paul says, you must each decide in your heart how much you to give. You see that? He doesn't say how much, 10%, 100%, 50%. Decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully for believers. The easiest avenue of giving in my mind is the local church. But if you don't want to do it, that is between you and God, but you're missing the point of giving. It's giving out of love and ministry. The area of giving, like many other areas of spirituality, God is looking at the attitude of your heart 
your service, your tithing, or your giving is, and it's a test. Is your heart trusting God? God is saying, are you willing to trust me and freely love me out of thankfulness? Or are you just trying to do this acceptance thing by what you do? See, Paul's solution to the whole area of divisiveness and arguments in the area of peripheral doctrines and in the area of any area of your life is first the gospel. First Corinthians chapter two, verse six, he starts, yet when I am among mature believers, I do not speak with words of wisdom. I do, sorry, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. In other words, they die. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our gl ultimate glory before the world began. And of course, he's speaking about the coming of the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the rulers of this world, which was, of course, the Jews and the Gentiles, both, uh, would not have, ha did not understand it or have not understood it if they had they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. Paul states the natural mind and the world's wisdom never lead to a relationship with God or God's truth. His way makes no sense to them and never made sense to us prior to the gospel. Only in the gospel message do we find God's power and wisdom, which leads to blessings and experiencing peace with God. You may have all the right terms and the verbiage, but until you experience the gospel, there are only religious words that have no meaning and no life in them. Like being born, like being born naturally, you can tell how it happened. You cannot tell how it happened. You can't give your surroundings, your parents, or your physical attributes. And it just happened. You were born. Yes, you may have all the right scientific terms and the knowledge of how babies come about, but these do not produce life. Only the act of intimacy can do that. And the giving of yourself, your body, your soul, and spirit to either one another or to God can produce the fruit of intimacy. Knowledge without Christ and without the gospel is just knowledge. And it just basically puffs us up according to scripture. In Jesus' day, Israel had a preconceived idea of their Messiah. They had all the knowledge. They had the prophets. They had the Old Testament wisdom books. They had everything going and the law to show them of the Messiah and what he would look like. But instead of seeing him, they had their preconceived ideas. And before their eyes, he walked with them. And yet they crucified him instead of receiving him because it came and he came in a different way. Every principle and question about God, such as giving, should not cause division and argument, but should drive us to seek God to get answers. It may seem foolish, but God's ways are never our ways. They're always higher than our ways. As Jesus says, there's many things you can't understand. And so he, this is in John 16, verse 12. There's so much more I want to tell you. He's talking to his disciples and his apostles, but you can't bear it now. So in other words, you can't understand. You're not ready. There's certain things in our spiritual walk we can't bear at the time. It'd probably blow us up or we just think, oh, that's never going to happen. And so what he says, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The role of pastoral teaching and discipleship as well as your role as Christ followers, is not to conform people to a denominational statement of faith or our own personal image, but to make a disciple of Christ Jesus, period. Religion and the world thrive on conformity and controversy. The gospel leads to the source of life, truth, and God's word. Are you leading people to your ways and your methods, or leading with the gospel, revealing God's way, and his words. Are you trying to be Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, that it was what that is what the scripture means when they say, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. 
Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher, and he's the next solution that Paul, in fact, he's the only solution, but it's through the gospel that we receive Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have, re or sorry, and we have received God's spirit, not the spirits of the world, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit reveals the Spirit of God, using the Spirit's word to explain spiritual truth. The second solution that Paul tells us, first is the gospel, but the second solution revealed by Paul's letter, and the only solution for staying out of religious debate and divisiveness, is God's Spirit. The gospel provides the way to God, but it's the Holy Spirit who reveals God through Jesus and empowers us to walk with God. All worldly wisdom and knowledge, social justice efforts, doctrinal education, denominations, catechisms, and personal methodology, as good as they may seem, will never reveal God's truth. Only God's Spirit does. Every spiritual discipline applied and experienced is because of Holy Spirit revelation. Many times we argue over those revelations, hence we have all the denomination. They start off in the Spirit and then they lead to religion because we want, like uh, John and Peter, when they had this big experience, they said, God, should we build tabernacles so we can camp here? And that's what denominationalism is. It's camping on a revelation given by the Spirit and then attacking people that look different. See, in the area of giving, my mom and dad taught me the principle of tithes and offerings. But it was God who opened my heart when he, came, when he called me back to his kingdom. It was him who taught me to tithe. At the time of my return to God's, my relationship with God, I had no spare money. I was broke, lots of debt. Or was anyone teaching me because I did not trust Christians, frankly. I thought they were all scammers. I just knew as I read through the scripture, part of honoring God was to give. Because of my upbringing in the Alliance Church, I used the base principle of 10% as I was taught as a child, and it was what I saw in scripture. My choice to give was Holy Spirit driven. I have questioned I have always had questions and thoughts and different things and tried, and, and I will admit I've had selfish intentions at times. I've created formulas of giving, I've, but I've played with the methods. And of course, this is what we do in every area of our life. It's part of growth. You have to test, you have to fail, and you have to try new things. To not do that is to not grow. And like everything in life, uh, in the end, God will bless your heart. Maturing naturally and spiritually involves testing, trying, and failing. Natural babies do not crawl, walk, feed, or clean themselves. It takes experience through training and trials. Spiritual matur maturity is in this world will always move between formula and faith, always involve deceivers, but in the end, it comes down to honoring God out of love and thankfulness, not duty. And it takes submission to the Holy Spirit and seeking God for direction. First John chapter 2, uh, uh, the writer John writes, I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you. So don't you don't need anyone to teach you what is true, for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. The way to receive the Holy Spirit is found in the gospel, accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The way to maturity is seeking Jesus through his written word and allowing God's Spirit to teach, convict, and reveal. Doctrine and experience are great, 
But if they replace Holy Spirit, division, argument, and sin are not far behind. The third solution that Paul gives us is confidence. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes in verse 14, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. Why? Because they didn't receive the gospel, hence they didn't receive the Spirit. It, also so, it all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves, excuse me, cannot be evaluated by others. Paul's third solution is confidence. My first pastor, John Wassel, in, in the Full Gospel Church, he was a phenomenal biblical teacher. Uh, and he made this statement that caused me to stop. He said, confident people in their faith don't argue. <laughs> at the time, I was good at arguing, and I still am good at arguing. But at the time, this caused me to reflect on my belief system. I realized he was right. Most of my arguments were a lack of confidence in what I believed, highlighted when people disagreed with me. Division reveals spiritual, reveals spiritual heart disease. When we become unteachable or cannot dialogue with people with a varying view, we're not walking in confidence. We're walking in our own understanding. Paul shares in Titus chapter 3, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. Hmm. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone. Hmm. We should look at that and must avoid what? Quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. If Holy Spirit is operating freely in our lives, we can have someone disagree with our position, but it will not upset our confidence in God or what we believe. If it, if it challenges us, it should create a researching aspect of our mind, not an argument or division. It should drive us to God's word and ask open questions to other believers and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. In the area of giving, ask yourself, why is tithing so controversial? It's kind of like speaking in tongues. Why is it such a controversial? There's two sides, I think. One is the enemy shows that he doesn't want you to get the principle of it. And the other is attitude. Have you tried it? Or if you don't believe in tithing, why is it important for you to get people to believe your way? Maybe there is a hurt or an offense or a self-desire, or maybe it's a lack of confidence driving your attitude. See, confidence always will create dialogue, learning, unity, and will dispel division, even if we have a disagreement. The third or the fourth and final one that Paul gives as a solution is trust. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. That's a big deal in the life of a Christian. You have the mind of Christ, and you can roll that over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, when it says that we use the mind of Christ to captivate every thought in the obedience of Christ, bringing down strongholds and vain imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Paul's final solution is trust. Walk in the mind of Christ. How many times we try to figure it all out, try to be God in our lives and the lives of others, and we end up and in others, and in the end, we do not fully understand everything, and if we did, that would make us God. We simply need to trust God when we don't understand things or ask questions and seek answers, but in the end of the day, we rest and trust in the person of Christ and his ability and Holy Spirit's ability to teach us for the glory of our Father. See, the kingdom of God is about giving up our self-autonomy. It's not giving up who you are as a person, but it's committing your ways to God. Jesus came to restore creation. The church exists to display this process, reveal God's character, and promote reconciliation and restoration under the Lordship of Christ Jesus, not debate on differences. Division created by heated debates 
on giving or any other non-essential only enhances Satan's kingdom, not trust in God. When I hear people say I choose where and when and what amount I give, my first thought that comes through my mind is who really is then in control of everything you own and who is in control of your life? When you make the choice, when you decide, is that under the direction of Jesus or is that under your own control? I do understand giving and tithing have been manipulated by many so-called church leaders and organizations to promote personal agendas and wealth. So discernment is necessary. But ultimately, if we are giving to God with thankful hearts, is he not able to handle the problem if people are being deceivers? And can he not judge wrong motives, either in this life or in the life to come? As I read the New Testament, it says that we will all give account, believers and unbelievers alike, before the judgment seat of God. Of course, as believers, we give an account and we're rewarded from what we did as believers. For unbelievers, we're given an account on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can never work your way into God. And so therefore, you'll be separated by choice. Matthew 6 says this, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. God instituted leadership gifts in the church to equip people for service, for maturing, so they are not deceived. So there is the need for leaders. And this is what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue. Listen to this. For those that dismiss some of these giftings, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Now, when we look at the church, are we fully walking in the mature and the stature and the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Of course it's not. So I guess we still need the gifts uh, to the full, to meet the full and confident standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. God has given us the mind of Christ to operate with discernment and to trust him when problems and controversy arrive. arise. The church, which is not a building, but God's people, have a responsibility to preach the gospel, teach people to obey Christ's teaching, and give Holy Spirit the freedom to build trust in God. In giving, I'll finish with this. I will teach people continually as a pastor to tithe or to give, depending on what you want to. Tithe simply just means 10%. And the reason I do that is because I see it in Scripture. Even though it's Old Testament principle, the heart of giving in the New Testament is generosity. And as Paul says, whatever God lays upon your heart. I use the base model of 10% in my own personal life and in my teaching. Uh, to giving, and I do it to the local church because it's the easiest avenue of giving. And I'm not here to cause controversy or or debates on it. That's what I will do. So if you don't want to do that, that's your choice, which can be uh, supported as a principle of giving and allow God to prove himself so we can trust him in provision. But more importantly, I will continue to teach every believer to pursue a deepening relationship with God through Jesus Christ to seek God for direction in sharing their faith with others, to live a moral and quiet life of integrity as a witness to your community, promote unity among God's family, not divisive debates, and to pray for the family of God, all people and governments, local and community, and to serve in a local church ministry, uh, also in the community they live, for building up faith and trust in God. As for the giving controversy, are you operating with the heart of Cain, giving some, or the heart of Abel, giving the first fruits? Paul states in 2 Corinthians verse 9, as I said earlier, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. 
and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Remember, you can't outgive God in an area of your life. He is the source of life and healthy giving, and he set the bar by his own standard by sending his one and only or his begotten son, Jesus, the first fruits of our faith in life of Christian walk. The question that I want to leave you with, and we're going to discuss now in our thought exchange in a different, it'll be rephrased differently. Are you trusting God in every area of your life, not just monetarily? And like him, giving generously, are you giving the first fruits of what God has given you? This is the heart of unity. And it breaks down the walls of division. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, as we enter into the thought exchange, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give wisdom and revelation and that we would live our life, not just in the area of giving, but in every area of our faith in a generous manner and promote a deepening relationship with you, Lord Jesus, not our own ways and our own self. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Another fine message. Thank you, Pastor Ron. And as he said, we're going into the thought exchange. For those of you who haven't been on Thought Exchange, especially on our Facebook, uh, it's probably easiest if you just come into our Zoom. So uh, if you'd like to join us this morning in this question, please uh, move over to vcop.ca and then look at the online worship and you will find a link there to join us in the Zoom and continue on with our question in, in the chat box. And I believe Pastor Ron is about...